Hey there guys, this is Mr. Herbst here and today my focus is going to be on common ancestors and evidence for evolution. Now, the main driver, the main concept of all of evolutionary biology is that all life is connected back in time through what we call common ancestors. So kind of like how you have a family tree in your family, well sort of there's a family tree of all of life that dates back to that first organism that we find in fossils. And to really kind of understand what that means, what is a common ancestor, I'm going to talk about the common ancestry of elephants. Well, around today, we find two types of elephants. we got your Asian elephants and your African elephants. There's really not too much of a difference between the two of them, other than uh, African elephants have larger ears that they use to flap around and keep themselves cool. But... Um, it's really not too far-fetched to take a look at a woolly mammoth, which went extinct around 15,000 years ago, and compare it to modern-day elephants and find all of these similarities. Well, science says that that didn't happen by random chance, but probably happened because uh, those organisms are all sort of related to one another, sort of like how you're related to your family. And if we take back and trace back these lines, they sort of all converge in the same spot right here. Right there, where I'm highlighting, is where we show that there is, there must have been some sort of common ancestor between mammoths and modern-day elephants. And that common ancestor probably looked very similar to mammoths and modern-day elephants. And then as evolution took over and Mother Nature and natural selection took over, um, they began to look more like mammoths or began to look more like Asian elephants or began to look more like African elephants. And you can go back in time even more. And you can see that there's these organisms that shared characteristics with modern-day elephants and mammals and, uh, and mammoths and all of these things, but yet uh, still probably looked a little bit different. And so over time, natural selection took over and uh, favored certain traits over others and began to have organisms look very different. And if you trace back all of life, according to science, all of life diverges back or uh, it shows that there was this one organism that we all share in common that it was around 3.8 billion years ago, according to our fossil record. And now science is all based on evidence. So where is the evidence to show that common ancestry exists? Well, one of those things is in what we call homologous structures. And I really want to emphasize that term homo, which means same. And so... If we take a look at the upper arm bone of many different types of animals, the upper arm bone of human beings, you may be familiar with uh, the different types of bones that are in the arm bone of a human. There's the humerus, the radius and ulna, and then the five different phalanges. Well, if we take a human being and compare it to, say, a whale, even though the humerus, the radius and ulna are sort of smushed together, they're still structured in very similar ways. And you know what's really cool? is that underneath of the fin of a whale are those five digits. Now you just don't see those on the outside because of course there's all the flesh in between each one, each five of those phalanges. And so if you compare even a lizard, a cat, a bat, a frog, a bird, they all have that same basic structure but the bones may be just kind of allotted or aligned in different ways. And so homologous structures are where we have the same structure but those structures probably have different function depending on the organism they're in. Another really cool uh, evidence for evolution is within vestigial structures. Uh, vestigial structures are, are functionless organs, but they still probably serve some sort of function within a related organism. No other example is better than your own appendix. The appendix is a pinky sized organ on the end of your cecum, which is the first part of your large intestine. The appendix doesn't really do very much good for us other than get inflamed, it would be really painful, I have to go to the hospital and get it taken out. It's called appendicitis. However, the appendix in rabbits still serves a huge function. It allows them to digest grass. Now us humans, we don't really eat grass so much and haven't eaten it in, uh, as a part of our diet in, in many thousands of years. And so sort of the appendix lost its function in human beings and thus um, it became smaller and what we call vestigial 
but it doesn't serve very much of a function. Another really good example of a vestigial structure is the hip bone of whales. Underneath of all that flesh of whales are these bones here that uh, look like hips, but they don't really serve any function for the whale. They are non-functional hips. And so the evidence here shows that um, why, would these, we, why would these structures be in these organisms if they didn't serve any function? They should have got eliminated. Well, probably there was a common ancestor that used those, uh, those structures uh, for living or for surviving. They were probably a really good adaptation for those previously common ancestor organisms, but over time they sort of lost their function and are still carried around as baggage in organisms that uh, are around today. Another really good example of an evidence for evolution is in with DNA itself. Now you may be familiar with the DNA sequence and you may be familiar with the nucleotides. All of DNA is made up of four basic nucleotides, A, T, G, and C, and how we have those long strings of them making up DNA. Well, what we find is that the closer that sequence is of DNA means closer related organisms both on the outside and on the inside. So, for example, let's say that we take, uh, we look at a monkey's DNA sequence, and we find the sequence is A T A G G C C T A. For example, it doesn't matter what it is, um, but if we compare it to a chimp, and we'll say a chimp has A T A G G C, and then we'll say A G A C A, and then we'll compare it to a human where a human would have A, T, A, G, G, C, and then maybe A, C, T, or something like that. Now, hopefully you can kind of see here that a chimp and a human have a closer DNA sequence than, say, a human and a monkey. Humans and monkeys are a lot more different. Right here, in fact, is the only difference between chimps and humans. So the DNA sequence is more closely related, thus indicating that we are probably closer related on the family tree of life. Moving on. Um, embryos, or studying embryology, is an indicator of evolution. It shows that how, um, how if we look at the first stage of development of embryos, this top part right in here, a fish, salamander, tortoise, chicken, pig, a cow, a rabbit, and a human all look very similar. This is really cool. They all look very similar at one time in their life as embryos. But over time, as the embryo develops, of course, it begins to look more and more like its adult form. However, the longer it takes to look more like its adult form means that organisms are more closely related. For example, Let's compare the embryos of a human and a, of a fish. A human and a fish. If we look at st step one, wow, they look very, very similar. Step two, now we're starting to see some differences. And then step three, take a look at that. A lot different looking adult forms. Now let's compare it to a human and a rabbit, for example. Human and rabbit, wow, very similar at first. Second stage of development, still very similar. Third stage of development, still kind of similar. But of course, a human and a rabbit eventually look very different as adults. And so that's indicating that a human and a rabbit are much more similar or closer related on the family tree or have a similar common ancestor or a closer common ancestor than, say, humans and fish. And what do rabbits and humans both have in common? And well, they both have four limbs and uh, we are both mammals. Another example of evolution or evidence of evolution is just studying cells, looking at cells, cytology. If we take a look here on the left, this is a plant cell, and on here, over here on the right, this is an animal cell. Now, um, at, at first glance, um, if you look at an animal and a plant and compare them on the outside, of course they look very different. But at the cellular level here, guys, plants and animals are not very different. There may be some differences. For example, you know, plants have a chloroplast and plants have a cell wall. But look at all the similarities. Well, they, all of these things right here in the middle, all of these organelles are all the ones that a plants and an animals have in common with one another. And, um, for example, uh, another evidence of evolution, and we'll talk about this later on, is called the endosymbiosis theory. If we just look over here at the mitochondria of an animal and a plant, 
we find DNA in there. But wait, I thought the DNA was supposed to be in the nucleus, and it is. The DNA in the nucleus controls what organisms look like. It's the genes in there. So why would there be DNA in the, in the, in the mitochondria? Well, the idea is that the mitochondria were um, free living organisms at one time that were absorbed by a larger organism that, and then eventually there was this symbiosis where there was um, this organism living inside of a larger one. And so the DNA found inside of the mitochondria is probably left over, indicating that um, evolution has occurred. We'll focus on that in a little bit, guys. Uh, another evidence of evolution is simply within fossils. If you take a look at fossils, uh, probably the first thing that when people think of fossils, they probably think of dinosaurs. But really, there is a whole lot of different kinds of fossils. Trilobites. We find these organisms that look like modern-day snails in the fossil record. And what's pretty cool is that the, digger, the, the farther we dig, or the deeper we dig, the more simple organisms begin to look. And so it's sort of like there's this opposite family tree. So if we go back in time, when we're digging, we're actually going back in time. Because things that are uh, uh, deposited on top are newer rock layers. And things on the bottom are older rock layers. It makes sense, right? If you're going to stack things up, you're going to stack newer stuff on top and older stuff on the bottom. And so if you dig deeper, you're going back in time. And we find that there are simpler organisms going back in time. And finally... The last evidence of evolution that we're going to talk about here is within these things called analogous structures. Analogous structures are kind of the opposite of homologous structures. Homologous structures, once again, if we compare the arm bones or the upper limb bones of many animals, we find that on its most basic level, they are structured the same, but they might have different functions. For example, a whale uh, fin was used for swimming, and an, a human arm bone is used for, of course, grabbing objects. But an analogous structure is the opposite, where we have the same function, but we probably have uh, different structures. For example, if we compare the wing of a butterfly and the wing of a bird, a bird has bone underneath of those feathers, skin, bone, and feathers. Well, the structure of a butterfly is an exoskeleton. It's not the same as a bird at all. They don't have bones. And so what do they, what do they have in common, though? Well, they both live in the air, right? They use those things to fly. And so Mother Nature um, selected for things that would be more favorable to allow them to fly. So analogous structures don't really indicate close common ancestry, because, you know, an insect and a bird are very opposite side of the spectrum. They're farther apart on the family tree. However, they both have in common one thing, where they live, their environment. So analogous structures are evidence of evolution in the sense that they both show um, similar environments. Another really good example of analogous structures is comparing a shark tail to a whale tail. Shark tails go left and right, side to side. They're made of cartilage. And whale tails go up and down, and they are made of bone. And But what do those both have in common, sharks and whales? They both live in the water, and so Mother Nature has selected for um, adaptations that allow them to swim. And so, of course, Mother Nature has um, uh, selected for adaptations that would do well, such as tails. Anyway here, guys, don't forget to complete the Google form below. This concludes a common ancestors and evidences for evolution. I'm signing off, folks. Y'all have a nice day.